All right, hey everyone. Uh, all right, I guess we should get started. Uh, my talk is machine learning generated data. I basically just picked the most boring thing I could think of because I had no idea what I was going to talk about till this morning. Uh, so I started this company called Legal Sifter. Basically, we use NLP, which is a form of uh, AI, to make sense out of legal documents without humans, right? Um, and my background is not in NLP or legal. Uh, my background is actually in HCI, so I don't really know how I landed that job, but moving on. Um, so the thing I really want to talk to you guys about is this concept I've been thinking about, which is sort of like designing for imperfection. And I think to give you guys a sense of what that means, maybe we take a step back and talk about like what, what perfection in computing devices was and why I miss it so much. So this is an abacus. You guys all probably know what an abacus is. It's a beautiful invention. Uh, those little Bs on the bottom represent ones and tens and hundreds, and the Bs on the top represent fives, fifties, five hundreds. And what I love so much about it is, is everything sort of represented right there, right? You have like the data, uh, you have the interface, like you're actually moving the data with your finger, right? There's no way that this thing can make a mistake. If you want to represent the number one, you just take your little finger and move it up. Uh, the technology is like instantly understandable by the user, right? Like there's no like mechanics or electronics. You're like, I totally get this thing. And the fundamental principles of an abacus, even if you don't get it, will take 15 minutes and, and it's totally there. Um, so what happens is people can actually build a really strong mental model of this abacus to the point where, like if you look on YouTube, some people can do abacus math without actually having the device, right? It's just in their brain and sometimes you'll see their fingers like, like twitch like that. So, so I really love the abacus. This thing uh, makes no sense to me. This is a slide rule, so this is like another great invention of our time. Um, if we apply the same analysis, you can see it's not quite as tight, right? Like the data are these notches and these numbers. Uh, the technology is pretty easy to understand, right? Like you see some little bolts and some plastic and some metal, and you have this like slide thing that moves back and forth. But when you get to understanding how a slide rule works, most people I bet in this room probably don't fully get it, right? Because it's based on logarithms and you guys are designers, you don't understand math, so. So maybe this is a little harder for you guys, right? Um, and so moving further and further along, right, we start having this like separation of interface and data and technology till we get to this thing, which is the, the CURTA calculator, right? So, so you have the data, that's those little, these little zeros right there, and the interface is like a crank and these little slide things that go up and down. Um, the thing I like about this is like the interface must have been completely dictated by the technology, right? Like there's no rational reason why a human would crank something to do addition and then crank it in the other way to do uh, subtraction, right? And so the interface was constrained by the tech. The other thing I like about this is you start being able to, as a user, you get this, you start being able to do sort of like research on a thing. Right? You could ask yourself, well, well, why does it crank? Why doesn't it like, have a button? And you're like, oh, well, maybe it's mechanical. Maybe it's not electronic. So, so, users, okay. so users start doing like, research on the thing. So now we're sort of at like, the modern calculator, the thing that we all think of as a calculator. And if you notice with this, right, you have the interfacing of the data. Everything else is like, completely obscured. Right? The tech, how it works, like, nobody knows anything. Um, and even if you take it apart, you still don't know. Like, I know something about electronics, so I guess that does something. But if, like, does it just remember that one plus one equals two? I have no, I have no freaking clue. Um, the good thing about all of these devices, right, is in some sense they were like perfect, right? Every time you type one plus one, you get two. One plus one, you get two. Blah blah blah. blah. Um, so what happens is you as a user can sort of have this like really strong like mental model of it, right? You can trust the calculator. Even though you don't understand it, you can trust it. And since you can trust it, like the concept of a calculator stops being like a thing and it's more just like an abstraction, right? Like we can do calculator stuff anywhere. A calculator can look like this, right? Uh, and as a designer, all we care about is the interface and the data, right? We've stopped caring about all of the mechanics. We don't have to think, well, this is a mechanical device, and like to do addition, you have to crank three times counterclockwise, and to do subtraction, you have to crank you know, counterclockwise two other ways, something like that. 
Um, so this has been like a big separation, I feel like. And I'm starting to think that this is going to move a little bit backwards, right? So here's another calculator, calculator subtraction. I don't have any notes, so I'm just kind of winging it. Um, another calculator. Uh, Okay, so uh, what happens when you have a calculator and like every hundredth time you type in one plus one, you get three, right? This is the sort of space that I feel like a lot of people are in right now and it's kind of a novel space, right? We haven't dealt with this for a while. Um, and so you're starting to ask yourself, well, I have to make this interface for a calculator, but the calculator doesn't work all the time. How do I think about that differently, right? And if you don't think about it differently, that's when things start failing. So, I mean, I think a lot of people say home automation is like too soon, right? Like you shouldn't adopt it, like you shouldn't put it in your house, it's way too soon. Well, I'm the idiot and I got one of these uh, smart locks, right? So I love my smart lock 90% of the time because it works 90% of the time. Um, and it doesn't work 10% of the time. But the problem is I got a smart lock because I wanted to carry less keys, right? That's great. Like, I'm just, like, living free. I got my phone. Uh, that's all. I got Apple Pay. That's all I really need. Um, and then it works 95% of the time. So, you know, what do I do? I carry the same number of keys. <laughs> and, and about once a month, I get super pissed off because I have to pull out that key. Right, and my goal, like, like, like I, have, I have two keys. My goal is to go to zero keys, that's a goal. I don't know why this became a goal, but it is, right? And so, you know, when I was thinking about this, a better interface would have been something like that, right? Where, you know, the key works, or the, the keylessness works 95% of the time, I just walk up, it senses my phone, it unlocks the door, and 5% of the time I type in some number, right? This would be way better. Um, so the keypad is kind of like a, a half step. Right, because the actual thing doesn't work all the time. So let's create a little, a little thing that you get to use every now and then. Um, and this is kind of what we did at Legal Sifter for one of our first projects, right? There are all these people like BNY Mellon and PNC, and they have all these contracts, and they're like, well, Elliot, we got this big PDF over here, and we want you to take some information and put it in this little Excel sheet, right? So we want you to take the start date out of this like 100 page document, put it in this little cell. And take the end date, put it in the cell. And we'd say, okay, well, start dates, we can nail like 90 out of 100. And end dates, we can nail, you know, 95 out of 100. And they're like, Elliot, that's not good enough, right? And so the engineers were kind of like, we are completely screwed. We are never going to get to 100% reliability. Uh, and this is the only thing they could think of, right? Because all engineers can think about is more engineering, right? Let's just do more engineering and like make it work better. Um, and I think a lot of times they're not thinking of like a design solution like a half step. So what we ended up doing is saying, okay, well we can't get a start date into this Excel sheet reliably, but we can give you like our best guesses, right? Our three best guesses. And our three best guesses are like 99.9% .9 accurate. Like it's in that list. And so what happens is instead of having an interface where you have a PDF and you're trying to get one little thing in that spreadsheet, we, we sort of, you know, smoosh it around like that. Um, and so uh, this is like the interface we made for BNY Mellon. So you have like the original PDF, you have some suggestions, um, and then you have like the little spreadsheety piece up there. Um, so that's a half step. I really don't know what this talk is about. Oh, so oh, here's another example of an imperfect system that I really love. This is Fantastical. I don't know if you guys use it. I think it's a $40 app on the Mac App Store, which is kind of insane. But it uses like natural language processing to understand um, dates and events. So I can type in something and it's like, oh, Elliot's typing something in, I'm gonna try to figure it out and I'm gonna try to normalize that, right? So when I say, prepare for World IA Day tomorrow, it knows that tomorrow is the 24th because I started preparing for this yesterday, which was the 23rd. Um, but if it got something wrong, I can like backspace, 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 and try something else. Like if 20, if tomorrow didn't work, I could try the 24th. If 24th didn't work, I could try February 24th, right? So it's like me and this computer, and we're kind of live cooperating together to reach a common goal. And it trains me just as much as, as well, it doesn't have any machine learning, but if it did, I could say that it trains me as much as I train it, right? And that's very nice, I, I like that. Um, <clears throat> and so yeah, that just breaks that out. And so at Legal Sifter, we had sort of a similar thing where we, we did this like cooperative approach where one client was like, okay, Elliot, like, you can get start dates, you can get end dates. Now can you get like effective date? 
An effective day sounds simple. It's, it's really not simple at all because an effective day a lot of times is like the day something signed and then some duration, right? So effective day could be like, oh, this contract is effective 30 days after it's signed. And so, you know, if you're only, say, like 50% accurate at figuring out the sign date and you're 50% accurate at figuring out this duration, you're only going to be right a quarter of the time. And no client wants to hear that, right? So it's like, okay, so how do I as a designer come up with something that's going to be way cheaper than hiring like 100 engineers to work on this problem and get 25% all the way up to like 99%? Um, and how do I get from this to something that actually makes a little more sense where the user and the machine are cooperating? So basically what we did was we came up with all these little ways that uh, the computer could like take these guesses, right? A computer can guess at like where the information is. A computer can take the information and guess at what like a normalized value is. There are all these guesses. And what we do is we just string them all together. Most of them are half right and half wrong. And we just show this to the user. And the user can say, oh, well, like machine, you know, step three was wrong, right? Step one and two are right, so let me just fix step three. And once step three is fixed, then step four and step five sort of get auto-filled in. And it's like, oh, you did step four right, let me, but you did step five wrong, so let me fill that in until you get to the solution, right? And so, you know, a lot of the times people come to us and say, well, you know, we want your machine to do X. And we're like, well, we can't have our machine do X. We can have our machine do 80% of X. And then you put some bodies on the 20%. Uh, I don't know, let's see. Oh, here's another. This is the greatest example of adopting imperfect information. Um, so I, I rediscovered this band called War. It's like a funk band from, I think, the 80s or 70s or 60s. You know, you're, you're old enough. You're, you're there. Um, and so I was like, oh, I want to like rediscover this band War. Like, what are the best war songs? And I Google best war songs, right? That's a terrible Google search because... All <laughs> Right, all it's doing is saying, here are songs about war. And I was like, that's not what I want. I don't want songs about war. So I type in war greatest hits. And then, and then I get the greatest hits, right? But the thing I love about Google so much is like how it makes me feel bad about myself, <laughs> right? Whatever Google did, like Google has this concept of like authority, which makes me feel like I'm to blame, right? I'm the user and it's my fault. I typed in a bad like Google search. I'm bad at it. They should teach a class. Uh, so that's why I love Google. Um, but the other thing that I think helps with this sense of authority is the amount of data they throw at you and how sometimes data is like additive and sometimes it's destructive, right? So the previous example, it's like the more parts we have to put together, the more wrong we are. Sometimes the more parts we put together, the more right we are. And I had this nice, because I didn't want to have any real math, I made these like nice things like this to talk about like more guesses becoming more and more correct. Um, and so this is the freelancer scorecard. This is a thing we made for like freelancers where you could upload a contract and this would tell you if the contract was more in favor of your client than you. Right, And so we had like 300 little models that we were pulling from, but if we had 3,000 models, it would be even better. And the thing is, like that little slider thing, no one second guessed it, right? Because there's all this data behind it, behind one single metric. Um, so yeah, I mean, the only thing I really wanted to say to you guys is like there is this sort of push and pull right now between like adoption and tech, and we think like tech needs to get to be to some level before people can adopt it. But I think really uh, us as designers can like create greater levels of adoption, of adoption earlier on, right? So these concepts of like half-step cooperation, blame shifting, we can take systems that are completely imperfect and we can still make users feel comfortable and trust those things. Um, and yeah, that's right. I thought that was the end. That's not the end. Uh, and so the other thing I just want to say was like, you know, going to school is all user-centered design, user-centered design. It's like it's all once we understand the user, then we can make this thing, right? And this thing is completely an abstraction, just like the calculator UI and all that. But like right now, this thing isn't just like an abstraction that's completely detached from the tech, right? So a lot of times I have to talk to engineers and say like, well, what can your thing do? And what does your thing suck at? And how do I make an interface that sort of like gets it from 98% to 100% so that the users can, can accept it? Um, so that's it. There's my Twitter handle. You can tweet at me. Don't email me or anything. Uh, Elliot Williams <laughs> at, on Twitter. So that's it. Thank you.